Van Hulst, Director of Research and Development for High Performance Computing at Ontario Centres of Excellence. But before we get started today, I'd like to read a, a letter from uh, Minister Goodyear. Minister Goodyear had hoped to attend uh, our conference here and uh, introduce this panel himself, but wasn't able to make it today. So I have a letter from him, uh, which I'll read right now. You are all participating in Discovery 2013 because whether you're in government, part of post-secondary institutions, a business leader or an entrepreneur, innovation and commercialization are top of mind. I am pleased to provide this message as you commence the High Performance Computing Theatre Session, which will focus on the Southern Ontario Smart Computing Innovation Platform, or SOSIP. As you may know, the SOSIP technology platform includes the fastest supercomputer in Canada and spans Southern Ontario. It brings together the assets of seven of our leading universities, IBM, and Southern Ontario's small and medium-sized enterprises. It is currently allowing Southern Ontario businesses to leverage this high-performance computing platform by partnering with leading Canadian academic and IBM researchers to advance their companies to a new level of success. I'm delighted to say that the platform has just celebrated its one-year anniversary and has already made its third call-out for project proposals. Since the project launched a little over a year ago, there have already been some great accomplishments, including the approval of over 34 projects extending across important areas such as health, water, energy, municipalities, and agile computing. Our government is proud to have contributed $20 million to help with the execution of this project, a project which is being led jointly by the University of Toronto and Western University and has connected numerous partners leveraging approximately $200 million in combined investment into the region's economy. Partnerships and collaboration are undoubtedly the way to move forward in today's economy and we are happy to support this collaborative research and innovative platform in Southern Ontario. Our government, as outlined in Economic Action Plan 2013, will take intentional steps to position Canada for success in the 21st century global economy. We will do this by investing in world-class research and innovation to help get concepts developed and moved from inside of labs and out into international mar markets. SOSIP is already creating opportunities and positive results for Canadians by using high performance and cloud computing infrastructure for research that is working towards solving the world's most complex problems. It is using the combined resources of all collaborators to develop leading edge products in sectors with global opportunities which will create an advantage for Southern Ontario into the future. Projects like this are important for a number of reasons which I know you will get into with this panel session shortly. We know, interest, we know investing in this area will ensure the expansion of our research capabilities and competitiveness. I think this is an area that has limitless possibilities, many of which I imagine you will discuss today. Enjoy your panel session. S -s Sincerely, the Honorable Gary Goodyear, Minister of State for the Federal Economic Development Agency of Southern Ontario. So I'd like to, at this time, uh, just explain a little bit about the SOSIP program. Uh, I came into this program. It was launched just over a year ago. In April, we had a, a one-year anniversary uh, event uh, celebrating the projects that came forward. At OCE, we've taken the responsibility to help small businesses engage in this program and participate in that. And we're proud to say that of the 34 projects announced so far, of which there'll be three more announced in a couple of minutes, uh, the, the, the rate of participation of, of small businesses is going. We have already 20 small businesses participating, many of which have set up booths uh, just in the high performance area uh, just around the corner and encourage you to meet these people and talk to them about their projects and think about perhaps project ideas of your own because this technology <coughs> is available for everyone. I've worked with some high performance computing startups and I know that um, Startups and small companies can leverage this technology to do things that they could never have done before. We'd like to ask you the following questions. What if your company could use data mining to discover new information, to identify new trends or correlations, or create new knowledge? What if you could safely simulate multi-million dollar physical assets and processes to accelerate your product development while preserving resources and reducing costs? We're asking, we're asking you to think big. We, we had an opening keynote address about abundance. 
we have Canada's fastest supercomputer, plus a cloud infrastructure with the, uh, and a wide array of high-level analytics tools, plus a research, leading-edge research technology for computing acceleration, all available for your use and for research projects. And we encourage people to think out of the box. What would you do with 1,000 times, 10,000 times the computing capacity that you have today? With thinking in that terms of abundance, what kind of opportunities could you create for your company? So we'd like to challenge you today, especially as you listen to the panelists, to think about your problems, the problems you're solving in your businesses, the problems you're solving in universities, and what would you do if you had an abundance of computing, more computing that you ever imagined that you could have. At this time, I'd like to introduce you to my co-moderator, which is at the other end of the floor there, Chris Pratt. He's Strategic Initiatives Executive at IBM Canada. Chris has national responsibility for managing IBM Canada's system and technology group activities in strategic areas, including high-performance computing, virtualization, and cloud. His background includes time as a founding member of IBM's Worldwide Server Consolidation Group, where he was co-inventor of IBM's Align methodology. I also heard this morning that he flew up to Peterborough for breakfast just because it was a beautiful morning. So I think Chris gets the concept <laughs> of abundance. Yeah. Thanks for being here today, Chris. And do you have an announcement for us? Yep. Well, good afternoon, Ron. Thanks very much. I did, and it was uh, tough to come back. It was a beautiful <laughs> Ontario morning, and I hear the rest of the week's going to be pretty nasty. So uh, up at the airport at 6.15 this morning was a good thing to do. So Ron and I are the eye candy, folks. These are the people who are going to tell you what really counts. But the first thing I'd like to do is say we're very excited today to announce three new projects at SOSIP. That takes it from 34 to 37. Uh, that's really key. The, the other thing about these projects, and I'm not going to read them or try and pronounce all the names of the various individuals involved because I won't do it justice. There is a slide behind me. But what's key is that one of these is business-led and two are academic-led. And that's the excitement where we're starting to see these worlds come together. The uh, Mission Critical Infrastructure Monitoring is the business-led project by Lar Laris Technologies out of Ottawa. And this will be using the sensor network to detect mission critical infrastructure failures in real time. And I think if we start to think about the way infrastructure does fail and the catastrophic downstream events of that failure, being able to detect it and model it and figure out what's going to happen next, we'll be able to make tremendous changes to, to how this is handled in the future. In terms of photodynamic cancer therapy, that's the next project. The Ontario Cancer Institute are working to dynamically change the efficiency of minimally invasive photodynamic therapy and treatment of head and neck cancers. Again, we all have heard it a hundred times. We've all been touched by somebody affected. So to see this type of research happening on the facility we have uh, that Ron described very briefly is very exciting to us. And the third project that I'm not going to do a great justice to announcing today, but I'd really urge you to go and read in more detail, is around the cryogenic decision support tool. Uh, this is where a team of folks are working on designing and implementing a decision support tool to assist cryogeneticists, that's not an easy word to say, in the selection of the appropriate probes to improve speed and accuracy of DNA microarray testing. Remarkable research happening right here in Ontario. So with that, I'd like to move on, and you gather there's a lot of notes here to make sure we cover the right things, to actually introduce you to our panelists. But the one thing I wanted to say uh, that Ron led to about use of computers, and I make this comment for what it's worth, all computers wait at the same speed. So the fact that it's Canada's most powerful supercomputer means nothing if it's doing nothing. The other thing about computers is they age very, very quickly, as we know from the technology we bought. What other piece of technology do you buy when you open the box has disposal instructions? You've just paid how much for that gadget? And the first thing you read is how to get rid of it. Unfortunately, that's the nature of the technology. Use it or lose it. So with that, uh, I'd like to start by introducing the furthest member of the panel from me. Uh, that would be, there's far more biographical information on the, on the web, but uh, Ted, Welcome, thank you very much. You're Vice President Ted Mayo is Vice President of Research at Trojan UV, Ultraviolets. Ted's responsibilities at Trojan have included building a world-class industry research team, industry-leading research team to develop innovative water treatment solutions, as well as developing a global network of external collaboration partners. His research portfolio has led to the development of several new technologies and applications. Ted is also responsible for Trojan Development Center in Shanghai, China, and for supporting market growth in the region. 
So Ted, I'd really like to uh, thank you for being with us. Over to you, Ron. Should I start? Oh, we're going to go through the introductions okay. and then, then we'll, we'll have your talks. The next is uh, Abe Heifetz, uh, CEO of Camatria. Camatria is a new company aiming to make drug development radically faster and cheaper using the power of high-performance computing and sophisticated statistical model modeling. Abraham is also a Massey Fellow at the University of Toronto, where his doctoral work uses artificial intelligence and machine learning to help plan organic synthesis, a long stand, or sorry, the organic synthesis, a long-standing challenge in chemistry. Previously, Abraham researched high-performance XML data processing at IBM TJ Watson Research Center. We're delighted you could join us today, Abe. Thanks, Ron. Uh, third panelist. Jennifer Waxman, I'd like to welcome you, Director of Research, Development and Commercialization at the Sargent Laboratory at the U of T. I also want to thank the person who put this in giant font, because my arms would be too short otherwise, right? Uh, Jennifer is responsible for currently uh, advancing research and development, industrial collaboration, commercialization in the laboratories of Professor Sargent and Professor Shanna Kelly. The areas of advanced materials, sol solar voltaics, biosensing and drug delivery, Jennifer has diverse experience in at the interface of industry and academia, and that's really exciting to us. After completing her PhD in bioengineering, she worked in the semiconductor industry in Boston as science and technology policy fellow at the National Academies in Washington, D.C. Thank you. Welcome. Next to uh, Jennifer is Dan Sinai, Associate Vice President of Research at Western University. Dan oversees the activities of research at Western, a centralized office that provides uh, support to the university community for all research initiatives, including grants and contracts. He has extensive R&D program and policy experience and has held a variety of key research administrative, administration positions with both government of Ontario and federal, the federal government. Dan, also, Dan has also worked for several high technology companies. Thanks for taking the time to join us today, Dan. And last but not least, Wayne, welcome. President Wayne B. Bradson, President and CEO of the Branham Group. Branham Group, which Wayne founded in 1990, is an information and communication technology industry analyst and strategic marketing consultancy company. The company's emerged as leading market intelligence brand in the global ICT industry and has assisted over 500 global brands in the area of planning, marketing, and partnering. Wayne also launched the, launched the Branham 300, the most comprehensive database of ICT companies in Canada, which I'm sure we're all familiar with. One whose particular passion is the use of technology in the health sector. Very pleased to have you with us, Wayne, and so uh, thanks for joining us. So to the folks on the floor, I'd really like to ask you if there are any questions, if you hold them until the end. There will be a Q&A period. I'd also like to remind you that if you're tweeting today, you know, if I'd said that a few years ago, people would have thought I was swearing. But anyway, if you are tweeting today, please use the hashtag OCE Discovery. Uh, so now what we're going to do is we're going to ask very deep and probing questions of our panelists. I'd like to start with you, Ted. And, and the depth of this question is, how is your organization leveraging HPC? If you'd like to give us a bit of background on that. OK. Um, first, maybe for those who are not familiar with uh, our company, Trojan Technologies, uh, we're in London, Ontario. So it's about two hours drive from here. And uh, we, uh, over the last 37 years, uh, we were fun funded in London, Ontario. We have established ourselves becoming the uh, leader in uh, treating water using ultraviolet light. So there's a reason why I'm holding this glass of water. Um, uh, treating the water, either the uh, uh, clean water for drinking, or uh, actually a significant portion of our business is a municipal wastewater treatment uh, using ultraviolet light uh, as a disinfection uh, technology. So uh, we have uh, uh, been using the uh, so-called high performance computing for the last uh, 15 years. And uh, uh, it's been really uh, beneficial for our business and uh, position us as uh, uh, com competitive as well as, uh, as the le leader in innovation. Uh, one good example is uh, uh, about seven years ago, uh, we entered into a very large project. Uh, you uh, probably all uh, have heard or know of uh, City of New York. Uh, uh, City of New York has a population over 10 million, and uh, their water is supplied centrally from two uh, treatment plants. In fact, over 100 years ago, City of New York had the vision. They acquired the uh, 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 
land surrounding the uh, reservoir uh, over 100 miles away from the city. So they had a pristine uh, water uh, uh, source. And uh, they had very little treatment before. And then with the uh, discovery of uh, a cryptosporidium and uh, giardia uh, parasites, uh, they were required to do treatment uh, by US EPA. Uh, the uh, solution to treating that water uh, was first considered using uh, filtration. Uh, that's a very effective way of uh, removal of uh, parasites. Uh, however, the cost was just uh, uh, in multi-billion dollar range, uh, cost prohibitive. Uh, with the uh, um, understanding and uh, uh, effectiveness of ultraviolet and uh, the EPA uh, required City of New York either installing a filtration plan or ultraviolet and uh, uh, using the ultraviolet was uh, 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 an order magnitude less than the filtration and uh, Trojan we were uh, entering into the uh, competition in fact we had to provide uh, a unique design uh, and that's where we uh, performed the uh, uh, computational fluid, fluid dynamic modeling, which is a very, very uh, computationally intensive. Uh, the unit uh, of uh, uh, ultraviolet is uh, pretty much the same length from Chris to Ron, this in length, and uh, it's about two meter uh, tall and two meter wide. Each unit could treat uh, 40, gallon, uh, 40 million gallon per day. Uh, that can serve uh, 200,000 population. So let's just give you a sense how large it is and uh, the ability to uh, compute, to model, and uh, model with uh, certain accuracy is very, very key. Uh, for the municipal sector, the competition is, uh, is very uh, fierce as well as uh, it's all very open because it's uh, based on open bidding process. So the ability to model that very quickly and to model with accuracy, that helped us to provide the, the appropriate solution in a cost-effective way. So that's just a one example of how we use the HPC to help us uh, 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 winning projects and uh, in fact uh, help us to be innovative, help us to position us well. And uh, that's, of course, you can argue, that's a, a more tens of billion dollar, uh, sorry, tens of million dollar project. You can afford to do that type of work. In fact, uh, even today, uh, when we do design of uh, small systems for your home and so on, we would uh, perform uh, uh, fluid dynamic modelings and uh, using this kind of infrastructure. So I want to congratulate uh, this project, this program, uh, how, uh, uh, how well, not only for academics, but for industries and for us, uh, for water treatment, for clean tech industries, we can use this kind of uh, in infrastructure to uh, advance our science, engineering, and uh, help our customers solving their problems. So thank you. Thank you, Ted. It's uh, great to hear uh, an Ontario company won that contract to clean the water for New York City through, through uh, using uh, that type of technology. It's a great win and congratulations. Abe, the next question is for you. Why did you decide to do a SOSA project? And take the time to tell us a little bit about um, you know, how the technology is going to leverage your company. Sure. Uh, I'd be very happy to. And I think if I tell you what we're doing, it'll become clear why it, SOSIP was less of a choice and more of a requirement. Um, so first, I think everybody here would agree that medicine is a good thing and that we need more and better. And that's whether we want chemotherapies that have uh, fewer side effects and are better tolerated, or whether we're talking about uh, global health issues such as malaria or uh, new diseases coming out, so uh, drug-resistant infections in hospitals or tuberculosis, uh, we are, end up in this red queen's race where we have to keep running as, as hard and as fast as we can just to keep healthy the way we are. So Chematria is trying to make the discovery of medicines more efficient. That's what we do. And I'll, I'll tell you how we use high-performance computing to do that. But, if I may, I would uh, set the stage just a little bit more. So today, to find a new medicine costs somewhere between a billion and a billion and a half dollars, and it takes something like 15 years. Uh, and the reason why that's so expensive is if you look at pharma companies 
data, you see that their success rates for a new project is something less than one-fifth of one percent for a new project. And this is with big teams of really smart people working as hard as they can, you have a terrible success rate. And the reason for that, if I may contrast it to all other forms of manufacturing, so every car that you drive in and every plane that you fly in, those are designed in a computer before they're ever actually built in the real world. But in pharmaceuticals, we physically construct every single prototype. And we physically test every single prototype to figure out what it's going to do. And of course, that's much less efficient. And so what we're trying to do here is to get the same kind of efficiencies that these other manufacturing uh, disciplines have, have seen from uh, computer-aided design. We're trying to get for pharmaceuticals. Now, that's a good idea. It's not my idea. Uh, people have tried to do this for about 30 years now. And so why do we believe that we can do better than, again, really smart people have worked really hard at for 30 years? And the answer is, of course, the, the reason why we're all sitting here is that computers today can do things which were impossible 30 years ago. So. And so for us, we're building uh, advanced statistical models using algorithms which were impractical 30 years ago. And we're running on data sets which are about 1,000 times larger. So, so before, when, when people had done this work before, there were thousands of data points. And we're using uh, millions or tens of millions. And you need new algorithms and, and new approaches. And you need uh, very strong computers to run them. And so for us, we, it wasn't a question of whether high-performance computing would make the project better. It was whether high-performance computing would make the project possible. Now, before SOSIP, we were running on commodity clusters. And it took us two months of flat out running on a cluster to get to the point where we were comfortable with our performance. But that means if we get a new idea, we have some insight. We wake up in the morning, we're, we're, we're in the shower, and we say, ah, that was what we should have done. Then it would take two months just to see whether we were right to run the experiment. And so it, it, it ties your hands. It constrains you into what you can and can't do. And so with uh, the blue gene, we want to be able to run many of those uh, ideas in parallel and really do science to figure out which models are giving us the best performance. And we're using that uh, for specifically to find uh, new treatments for leukemia, but also through uh, Grand Challenges Canada and the government of, of Canada, we have projects, the same predictors, because chemistry is chemistry everywhere in the universe, physics is physics everywhere in the universe, we can use that same predictor uh, to find new treatments for malaria and to reduce pesticide toxicity. So it's several projects, all of which are benefiting from, from the SOSIP program. Great. Thanks, Ed. Appreciate that. Uh, Jennifer, turning to you now, I'd like to ask you, what was your motivation for your organization to get involved in SOSIP? Sure. Um, so at first, I'd like to start and just give you some background on what we're actually trying to do in our group. Um, and then explain how the SOSIP project really fits in with, with our overarching goals. Um, so I work with Ted Sargent at the University of Toronto. We're a group of about 30 people who are all trying to make an entirely new type of solar cell. This solar cell uh, would be based on quantum dots, uh, which are very unique particles that offer very uh, special properties that we can leverage to create um, a really compelling third generation renewable energy technology. Um, so why, why are we trying to develop a new solar technology? There are existing technologies out there. Um, we feel that these are, are simply too expensive to compete unsubsidized with fossil fuels. Uh, we have abundant and free solar energy everywhere, and yet this uh, renewable source makes up well less than 1% of our energy mix today. So how can we take this uh, nanotechnology solution and, and address this issue of cost? Um, solar or quantum dots are unique particles that are synthesized in solution. So, um, in fact, I have a little jar here, if you can see this. We essentially create what is a solar ink. 
um, that we can then apply to various substrates, including flexible substrates. And when you can do that, you open up a whole new realm, realm of manufacturing where you can leverage technologies such as spray coating and reel-to-reel -reel processing. I mean, if, if you want to visualize it, you could essentially print a solar cell just like you might print a newspaper, uh, making it very low cost and high throughput. Um, so where are we now in our progress? Well, we've managed to drive up efficiencies to over 7% certified externally. Um, this is a, a record for this type of solar cell, but as you can imagine, this number is probably not good enough to compete in the real world. Um, so we're still uh, actively um, driving our research forward in terms of improving our performance, our photovoltaic performance. And one of the things that we have to look at when we do that is uh, the quantum dots themselves. So when you create a film out of a uh, colloidal nanoparticle, um, the way these particles interact with each other is, is very important. When you have a, a nanoparticle, the, the surface area is very, very large relative to its volume. And so we must have exquisite control over what molecules are on this surface. Um, so we, a lot of the work in our group is focused on developing strategies for attaching specific molecules to this surface and how we integrate the particles into a film. So you might be wondering, how does high-performance computing come into this technology? Um, we're using high-performance computing to model the surface of our quantum dots. If, um, by looking at how different molecules affect things like charge transport, we can predict the overall um, benefit to the solar cell when you integrate these particles into a film. Now, we can do this currently on, on available computing resources, but we can only model about 1,000 atoms, which sounds like a lot, but actually it's not when you're talking about an entire uh, film of nanoparticles. What we really like to do is, is orders of magnitude more than this, and we'd like to look at multiple particles together. Um, one of the things that the SOSA project is really going to play a key role in is how to model charge transport between quantum dots. Um, and this will open up a whole new realm of, of possible investigation for our group. So the modeling is going to play a, a very key role as part of a much bigger project where we combine empirical investigations with rational design of our quantum dot surface. Um, no matter how many grad students you have in the group, you can only run so many experiments in a given day. And therefore, we need some kind of direction in terms of, of which molecules to choose, how do we passivate our surfaces, um, and how do we really create the next breakthrough in, in quantum dot solar te technology. Um, one of the other things that I'd like to mention since this conference is all about translating research into uh, commercial success is that our plan is to ultimately spin this technology off into a startup company. Um, so the role of, of OCE and IBM in this project is really key to not only doing great science, but also accelerating our progress so that A, we can create a compelling product that can uh, meet market needs faster. Um, and then also playing a, a key industrial strategic role as we actually try to build the business plan and launch this technology um, as hopefully you know, our own SME eventually. We don't actually have an SME partner. We're hoping to create that SME partner with this technology. So we're really excited to be a part of this program. Um, we were thrilled to be a part of the IBM Research Consortium in April and uh, meet other people who are also working in computational nanomaterials and other areas of high performance computing. So we're really, really excited to be a part of this network, and uh, we hope that we can also achieve a commercialization success at the end. Well, thank you, Jennifer. It uh, did made me think of, again, our keynote address earlier today about abundance, and he looked at he had the image of solar energy, and solar energy is that sort of unlimited amount of energy that we have uh, to drive innovation and drive our lifestyles here on this planet. So I look forward to your innovations from your group. Dan, next question is for Dan. What are the strategic benefits of high-performance computing and research collaborations for Western? Thanks, Ron. Um, so I'm going to take a little different tact, and I'm going to also include not just Western, but the other seven partners that we have in a consortium. So if people know we have uh, the University of Waterloo, McMaster University, University of Toronto, University of Ontario Institute of Technology, Queen's University, and University of Ottawa. And for all of us, I would say that the, the biggest benefit for HPC is, is how this links to a lot of our strategic research areas. So at Western, for instance, you know, we've, we've identified medical imaging, neuroscience, 
we in engineering, material science, like nano, nanoparticles, as key strategic areas for the university. And high performance computing plays a role in, in all those the strategic areas. So if you go around to all the universities, you can probably identify a strategic strength that they would have and how high performance computing can enhance that strategic strength at the universities. For, for me, a really big one is the fact that you know, several billions of dollars have been spent on physical infrastructure at each of these universities, and particularly at Western. So we have very sophisticated medical imaging equipment. We have a new $35 million wind tunnel that we're building. Uh, it's the first hexagonal 3D wind tunnel in the world. Um, and the link of high performance computing to the physical infrastructure that are on campus, I think is a huge strategic benefit. Um, so a lot of people, you know, before they can go into an MRI machine, which is actually extremely expensive to, to use, get the patient in there, have all the ethics approvals and everything else, the ability to be able to do the modeling uh, before you get into these very, very expensive physical infrastructure is a huge benefit, I think, to, uh, to small companies and, and to researchers before they, they actually start spending some, some real dollars. Um, universities are in the business of training students, postdoctoral fellows, um, grad students, uh, both the undergrad and the student, uh, and the undergrad and, and at the grad level. And uh, certainly, high performance computing is, is a huge opportunity for us to be able to train the next generation of students um, in, in these kind of techniques. Uh, IBM was generous enough to give us a $65 million gift. Of, uh, of computing uh, software and analytical tools. This is a huge opportunity for uh, students to be able to use those, those tools for their uh, theses and for their, their training. And that's what we want to do, is we want to train these students uh, on the latest techniques, the related software and, and hardware. And finally, from a strategic view from the university's perspective, the link to industry is key. You know, as government funding starts to uh, be linked to industrial benefit, to economic benefit. I think that the high performance computing is a gate, great gateway to other projects. We already now have, uh, we have seven projects, and this was an eighth that Chris announced today with, uh, with Western. Nearly all of them have an industrial partner, and that's a relationship that we're going to build and we're going to sustain for, for a very, very long period of time. So I see high performance computing strategically as a great gateway and an easy gateway to be able to, to, to build a partnership. We partnered with Trojan. Uh, many, many years ago through SharkNet and high performance computing. And that relationship we have with Trojan continues to this day. So it was eight years ago, you said, uh, Ted, that we started that relationship and that relationship is still flourishing. So I see that uh, as a great opportunity. Thanks, Dan. Great. Excellent, I really appreciate that. So with that, I'd like to ask Wayne, the last uh, formal question is, what are others doing in H HPC land? Uh, thank you so much, Chris. Uh, Again, uh, just a, by way of introduction, our firm does not use uh, HPC technology to any extent. We're a market research organization. What we do is investigate and explore the ways in which organizations across multiple industries are using various technologies. And in the last year, year and a half, our research in the area of HPC data analysis, business intelligence, big data has dramatically increased. And what we're seeing now where HPC was a unknown um, acronym in our, in our industry five, six, seven years ago is increasingly becoming one that is of, of dire focus. Uh, I'm going to bring uh, your attention to some of the research we did across the United States, UK, and, and thirdly Canada in the areas of healthcare, specifically hospitals, the payer systems, and, uh, and life sciences, specifically pharmaceuticals. Um, what I've just heard across my federal panelists are are very specific projects that don't, uh, and unfortunately don't re uh, get to the commercialized press enough because it's very exciting research. Um, and, and as you listen to this type of work, you wonder to what extent is it, it's really hit the commercial marketplace in a, wide sp a widespread way. Um, ladies and gentlemen, HBC is now prime time in many organizations. The amount of data and streaming data that's coming into organizations across hospitals, pharma, and payer, for instance, is uh, growing at a compound annual growth rate of 30 to 75 percent. In fact, 83 percent in the payer systems across the United States. The, these organizations are dealing with massive amounts of information coming from disparate systems that are not necessarily interoperable, and they have to make real-life decisions about, about, their, uh, about their clientele and customers, and they are now facing a huge challenge. 
uh, to deal with in terms of having rapid approaches to, uh, to uh, diagnoses and so on. Let's take, for instance, the, uh, the pharmaceutical industry. Many of you are probably well aware that there is a regulatory requirement for not only companies here in Canada, but companies in the United States and UK to respond to consumer uh, inquiries about a specific product. For instance, maybe perhaps a large pharmaceutical company has built a, or designed or has, has marketed a product that, that seems to reduce uh, scarring on the external part of your skin. And uh, they may have to deal with a, uh, with a request to say that my, my skin turned red immediately within 24 hours of using this product. And they have to respond within 24, in some cases, uh, 50 hours, 75 hours, and so on. Um, pharmaceutical organizations have set up massive response mechanisms within their organizations on a customer support area. And right now, they're dealing with a huge human middleware challenge. And that is, it's a combination of computational resources and people resources. And uh, quite simply, the payer, the pharmaceutical, the, the hospital organizations don't have the capacity to deal with this anymore. Um, with, the, with the enormous uh, uh, democratization of, of data through smartphone technologies and tablets, the amount of data that's flowing into an organization has dramatically increased as well. And so they're looking for computational methodologies. There is a huge uh, mid-Northwest -north hospital just spent $67 million on refreshing their whole hospital information systems. And what they have to do now is uh, spend another $27 million to understand how they can utilize these systems in a big data format. And they're looking at HPC systems to do that going forward. And one of the major challenges, ladies and gentlemen, and you would know this as, as users of the healthcare system, is a lot of the information that's contained about you in an EHR for instance, is not, uh, it's not uh, structured, it's unstructured. And for many organizations, these organizations, uh, for many years, we've never tapped into the power of and, and, and the richness of unstructured information. But this requires enormous computational requirements going forward. So uh, I could get into a lot of specificity in this, and perhaps it will through the, 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 the discussion. But I'm here to say that HPC is becoming real time in large organizations in a very commoditized way and will be in the next couple of years. So what's happening here in a lot of the research has to be uh, proliferated out to those large organizations to see how we can move forward and use this technology in a, in a, in a greater way. But let me just say this. Well, your traditional database ar architectures, your, uh, your data warehousing technologies, your business intelligence technologies, and the massive investment made in those architectures within five years are going to be gone. Organizations now, not only in those three, but also in, 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 in manufacturing, uh, advanced manufacturing, in mining. We did a recent project for Osisco in the, I don't know how many of you are, are into mining or whatever, but there's huge computational requirements to, with an open pit mine. And we help them understand the kind of technology that, that could be used in their gold mine, uh, open pit mine up in Millard, Quebec. But, but the, what's going to happen is organizations are trying to understand the correlations, the data that they need coming into the organization. And that will be filtered into, into their response mechanisms internally to support corporate goals and objectives achievement. Beyond that, and it's all going to be stored in a, in a, you know, a, 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 a VNA structure. And, and so your, your, current under, your current database structures and so on, that sort of thing is going to go away. And we're getting into huge unstructured data streaming and so on. And this is where HBC is going to play a huge commercial role going forward. Thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, appreciate that. So when, just wanted to pick up, Ron, while you think of your questions, because we've come to the point in the, in the day where we'd like you folks to, to come up with your questions direct them to any member of the panelists, use a microphone, please, if you can. But uh, just on that point, we, we heard in the keynote the discussion on Watson. Uh, those of you who didn't run off early on Friday may have seen there was an announcement that Watson is now going into customer service, and one of the earliest adopters of that will be the Royal Bank in Canada. Imagine finally dealing with a customer service rep that's read every single document there is to be read and understands every single customer interaction that's ever happened with the organization is prepared to deal with you with your funny accent or their funny accent without any form of, of emotion base. So we're seeing this commercialization far more rapidly than, than, than many would, would think. So with that, we'd like to ask you folks if you could please, uh, if you have any questions. And while we're waiting for people 
to, you know, think of their questions. I was just wondering if some of the panelists have some questions for each other. We've seen the long-term relationship that's developed between Dan and Ted here through high-performance computing. And we'd like the opportunity, perhaps, to think of some of the questions you have for each other. But I see we do have one question from the floor. So we'll, we'll start. Bill? Yeah. Um, I'll start with an interesting one because, um, I mean, SOSIP obviously makes access, if you've got a good project, relatively cheap, right, in terms of the cycles. But you know, there are other factors which limit you know, companies' access to high-performance computing, whether it's awareness of it, whether it's the expertise you know, to make use of it, um, or whether it's, if you like, the, the data access problems and data security. So, so one of the questions is, uh, what should Ontario be doing, or, or Canada more generally, or organizations to, to, you know, to break down those barriers, which are probably going to be different for, for different types of organizations, especially difficult for, say, SMEs. So uh, it's a generic question to you know, all of you, Ron, so thanks. That's a really good question, Bill. In fact, we had a pre-meeting for, for a lot of the SOSIP stakeholders, and we were talking with some industry representatives, including one of our SOSIP award winners, and talking about segmentation of the different types of companies that can take advantage of HPC. Dan, did you want to take, take a stab at, at how we might address some of these barriers and gaps? Yeah, so, so Ron said that we, we met this morning with a number of stakeholders in industry and they did identify a number of barriers. And the number one is, is skills. And so what we want to do in SOSIP is we want to grow from um, a couple of dozen companies to hundreds of companies that could be able to use uh, SOSIP. Right now, the way we're doing it is we're linking the skills, the people, okay, let me back up a second, the people who don't even know how to speak HPC language or even spell HPC with the people who are over the top with respect to the, to the computer sciences. How do you link the two? The key is that what we're doing with SOSIP right now is just having that intermediary, that postdoc or a technical person to be able to speak the languages of both, both parties. But how do you make that sustainable? You can't over hundreds of, uh, hundreds of companies, you can't service. So the only way you're going to be able to do that is to train the people in those companies to be able to use high performance computing. And that's what we talked about this morning is these training workshops and training sessions or whatever for companies who don't even know how to, uh, where to even begin. So the first thing is outreach, get people to understand that, uh, that uh, high performance computing can be used for their company. And the second is to provide them with, uh, with skills training so that they can have people within their own environment, their own company, um, you know, to be able to build, it, build up the, the, the buzz within, within the company. Uh, I don't know, maybe Ted can, can answer about how your company even started with HPC. I mean, how did you learn about it and what, what, was the bar what were the barriers and how did you meet the barriers? Yeah, um, I mean, it's in, it's, I think uh, there's a, there, is, there are some barriers we're still trying to overcome. Uh, one example is in my office, and uh, Dan, most recently probably you've been to, I have a, a, a cluster in my office, and uh, there are 30, 32 processors. So it's about uh, three years old, and I'm sure it's a lot better and faster. And Dan mentioned uh, Western has a shark net. Uh, we were trying to access and apply our problem solving there. So, so I think for, for us uh, as a, a water treatment technology and commercialization enterprise, uh, you know, for us, it's a, it was a, a commitment we made uh, over 10 years ago, and uh, we want to uh, compete on science, engineering, innovation. We have to do that uh, faster, better, and uh, holistically, a lower cost and more competitive. Uh, why I say holistically is, is because uh, when you do get into the HPC, you need the ac expertise, you need to have uh, the hard hardware, and also software license, they're not inexpensive. And uh, it's, it is a long-term payback. Uh, it does require some big projects like New York City and other projects to help pay for some of that. Uh, but it, it's really the commitment you have to make and then you have to grow that expertise. You have to uh, bring experts in-house. You have to collaborate with universities uh, like Western. And also, um, you know, computation is computation and uh, uh, you have to validate your models and so you have to run experiments uh, on the side to make sure your models are 
accurate. So it takes a lot of efforts and uh, commitment. I think one barrier is uh, um, how to set up the so-called firewall. So one have my models running on, on your uh, HPC network with uh, maybe hundreds of thousands of nodes, and how to make sure that data is secure, and uh, also how, how, to, how to apply commercial uh, software license. And uh, we do have a parallel process license and so on. And uh, so, so there's no, absolutely no concerns on, first, security, confidentiality, and then the copyrights and the, the licensing agreement. So some, I'm sure those barriers can be overcome, but it's, it is something not only uh, I think the uh, expert modelers have to learn uh, when you say workshops, but uh, that has to be translated into internal communication. I have to convince our uh, IT manager, not only at Trojan Technologies, but also at corporate. There's just many, many uh, layer of that kind of due diligence. Uh, we have to know because the changes are happening and uh, we, we learn a lot through the previous speaker at the uh, keynote and also the panel. And uh, that's something we have to bring that back to our organization. I'm wondering, um before perhaps we take another question, uh, Wayne, in your market research, what other barriers to adoption have you seen in the companies that you studied? I was just reading into this question a little bit, and I and right away thought about industrial strategy. I, I, I thought the gentleman I was getting at some, what, what can Ontario do to galvanize the entire industry sector base to utilize this technology to be far more competitive out there, right? Let me start from, a, from a, you know, an example. Uh, the human middleware cost associated with, with, um, with data analysis in three, a hospital corporation here north of Toronto is astronomical. Astronomical. Uh, the, the, the people, the human middleware cost or the people cost associated with this is incredible. And, and we still haven't leveraged technology in such a way that we can actually access that information quickly, model it, and, and respond. And I think that we need to, this may be, uh, again, we do a lot of research in healthcare, and this may be self-serving uh, a little bit, but 46% of our province's budget is spent on healthcare, right? It's one of the biggest challenges that we have. If you look at our emergency wards, our waiting list, you look at you know, our whole healthcare ecosystem, there's a huge opportunity for us, if we would like in this province, and more importantly across Canada, to put together an industrial strategy focused on using this type of computational technology to help people that are delivering healthcare. And guess what's really happening? Up until maybe a year ago, we really truly had a reactive healthcare system. None of the, the deliveries of healthcare advice to you had the ability to actually do any predictive and analytical uh, analysis and using this technology going forward. And so we're moving into you know, preventative wellness and the shift from reactive healthcare to preventative wellness, by the way, is a technology shift. And we have to harness technology like this in a big, big way. So I'm at multiple layers in terms of how I'm answering that initial question, but initially I thought about an industrial strategy. Uh, you know, in Ontario, we have a huge financial services industry, and I'm glad to hear that, you know, some of the IBM technology is going to be used in, in, in this sort of way going forward. But why can't we leverage this stuff to benefit our industry going forward, right? One of, uh, you know, Ontario's strongest uh, sectors, of course, is in manufacturing. We're actually, the output in our manufacturing sector in Ontario is the same as it was 15, 20 years ago, but with less people, we're harnessing technology. Can you just imagine if we were to, you know, open up the pipe and introduce HPC technology a little bit more uh, to that industrial sector, right? What we haven't done is captured the imagination of the people that make decisions in this area to go forward. Right? And here's examples right across here, right here on the, on the floor of organizations and people that are using this technology because they know it's their only alternative, the only solution to actually getting at the information they need going forward. So an industrial strategy, by the way, we have a problem in this country. We don't know what industrial strategy means. You know, for those that have been long, around long enough, remember the fifth generation project heralded by the Japanese, right? It replaced the shipbuilding industry. The Japanese government said, as we're the, we're the leader in the shipbuilding building industry, we're now finished with that. 
We're putting all our money into the fifth generation project. I'm 55, that was 25, 30 years ago. Every one of us and all the consumer devices that we're using today are beneficiaries of that huge investment in the fifth generation project. The first four or five years were tough for the Japanese government, but they actually had an industrial strategy. Here in this country, we don't. We don't have an industrial strategy in around using HBC. Our digital economy strategy is terrible, right? That should be one of the corner stores of our you know, digital economy strategies going forward and engaging industries, right, to make them far more competitive. How do we get our people to get to that point, Thanks, right? Sir. <laughs> yeah, but I, I'm, I'm using a good one, the fifth generation project. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, but at least they, they attempted. So, Wayne, thanks. I, I think, Abe, you, you indicated you had a, an observation. If, if we have time. Well, I think, I think this question has broadened dramatically. The, yeah, the, sure. Three. So I, I just want to point out that uh, on the technical side, you were talking about a gap between the value that you can get from high-performance computing and, and the skills that people maybe lack to um, be able to derive that value. And so I, I want to talk about the fact that on the technical side, people start building a bridge when people realize that there are, um, there is value there, and the tools that you need to extract that value are uh, general, right? Uh, there's, there's similar fundamental shape to the problems underlying things. People build tools that let you abstract away that problem. And so here, I, just to make it concrete, uh, when Google published MapReduce, lots of people, you know, this was a programming paradigm, and many, many programmers who had never thought about making their code run in a high performance setting, all of a sudden said, oh, that's not so hard, I could use that. And then from MapReduce, we had open source implementations of these things, right, in, in Hadoop and all of the things that are built on Hadoop, right? And so today, it's not that you have to go build your own MapReduce implementation, although you can, uh, and we do. Uh, you don't have to, right? Um, so there's a number of technologies, both within uh, within a company. So so Google's uh, MapReduce, and then they went to the Sawzall programming language and Go and so forth, using ideas that came out of Lisp now, you know, 60 years ago, right? Um, and similarly, if you look. In, in a broader ecosystem, so not just within a single company, but in a broader ecosystem sense, there's many uh, companies that are built to make the Amazon Elastic Compute Cloud more accessible, where, where you don't have to bootstrap the whole thing. Right? Uh, and so, so there, I think, you get this virtuous cycle as people start solving things. The skills you need uh, to get that value, you, you end up building a bridge where everyone's working together. Uh, and so I think. I think organically uh, the problem of lack of skill set gets mitigated over time. All right, so uh, we get the flag for another minute. I've got six minutes on the counter here and one minute back there, so I think we got a, a few minutes late start. Everything was shifted a bit. Is there one more question from the floor that, uh, that we can address to our panel? I don't see anybody rushing to the microphones. Um, do we have, amongst the panel here, do any of you have a question for each other? I have a quick question. Um, so we work in an academic environment, so we like to tell everybody everything about what we do all the time. Uh, I'm curious, in the, the corporate environment, especially in a startup situation, you know, how freely do you share your, you know, your simulation models, your, your procedures? Going back to this skills issue, is it an open culture? Sure. Um, do you want to Did start? you want to address that one, Ted? You're talking about startup. Well, so even an established company. I mean, are you open with your procedures and your tools? With with the general public? Yes. No. <laughs> <laughs> that's proprietary. I, I think that's a piece where uh, you know I, I commented on the security, the data, the sensitivity. Um, at least for us, it's a it's a uh, core core competency we decide to hold in-house. Uh, we have, we have uh, I think, three PhDs hired, dedicated for developing models and uh, so on. So it's a big commitment, and uh, it truly it is a competitive advantage. And uh, um, you know, every percent you can improve in your accuracy or you can 
improve your performance that goes into your margin. And so the answer is unfortunately no. <laughs> okay. Uh, one so, more comment there, and because I know we're keeping people from the refreshments. I, so I can make a comment in terms of a Cisco up in, in Malartic. They're an oil mine, uh, uh, sorry, um, gold mining company. They have no interest in sharing with anybody what the, uh, what they do. None, squat, nano. That's a competitive advantage. Yeah. So right. I it's all about yield management. I'm pleased to say that we at IBM do share a bunch of things. So not everything, for sure. We need the competitive edge. But you know, Ron, I know you we, we, we're spiraling down. I just wanted to make one observation with relates to SOSIP and the type of projects we're seeing. And I think it, it ties back to what you said, Jennifer. Remember the days when you got all excited when you got a new computer at home? You got to put a new operating system on and you got to install the software. Now it's the worst thing that can possibly happen is a new computer. You just, want, you just want time to value. You just want the thing to work. The same is true in research and high-performance high computing. You know, I've been around IBM 33 years, and, and it used to be the fun and games was building the computer to make it work. We still got guys who do that, right, and people who do that. But the reality is it's about getting somebody else. You know, the best drivers in the world have people, they have pit crews. They don't maintain their own cars. The best people in terms of high-performance computing should have other computer scientists put together the fastest machines for them to use so they can get on with their research and not spend half the time keeping the computer going. And that's what's key to what we heard earlier, is using the facilities that are put up by other people who know what they're doing, so you can do what you do, whatever that area of research is. Right. So with that, Ron, I think that's OK, thank you, Chris. Um, we are running low on time. Uh, before we end, I would like to thank our panelists, Ted Mayo, Abe Heifetz, Jennifer Flexman, Dan Sina, and Wayne Gabranson for taking the time to share with us how they've used HPC and why they believe it's important. We really appreciate them being here with us today. As a token of our thanks, we'd like to, them to accept a small gesture. And I was supposed to have a package here. So there we go. There's our package. I'll let, I'll let Sharon hand out their, their thank you gifts. On behalf of OCE, I would also like to take uh, the chance to thank my co-moderator, Chris Pratt, for an excellent job. Um, we could make it, oh, I don't know if I want to do that. But anyway, so there's a, there's a joke there. But I think I'll pass on that. Um, Next in this theater tomorrow, we have some more panels, uh, sensor-based nanotechnology research. Before we, before we depart, I do want to throw out the challenge uh, to, to the attendees here. You've heard about lots of excellent research projects, uh, startups, established companies, um, universities that are using this to drive partnerships. Think about what you can use HPC for. We have a dedicated area. We have several posters showing how HPC is being used today. We have a number of companies that have come who've started SOSA projects. They can tell you how they're using HPC. The challenge is don't just walk away, but think about abundance. We have an abundance of computing technology. It's available. Talk to us about your ideas. I'm going to be hanging out. I've got some comfortable Thank chairs you. under Thanks the so HPC banner. We want people to come. Tell us your ideas. We have people here from various universities. We have people here from IBM. The panelists will be around. Give us your ideas on what you could do with orders of magnitude more computing, and perhaps we can launch you with a research project, a SOSA project, or even a project with one of the other universities. They're here to work with you and to help you succeed in your research and in commercialization goals. Again, thank you very much. Thank you.